Hey, Silver Forum. Thank you all for coming out. Um, my name is Director Francis. I'm the Director of Education here at the Monshire. And every now and then, Monshire is really glad to co-host events that make sense as far as science reasons and, 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 and important issues that are affecting uh, life here in River Valley. Um, a few things. I'm going to put on my PR hat, otherwise I get yelled at by, by our PR communications director. This Friday night, we're having our last of the season Montchart Unleashed event, so if you like good beer and good music and you want to play like a kid with no kids from 6 o'clock to 9 o'clock, the Montchart is open, free with admission, really fun stuff. And then also, of course, we have our upcoming uh, auction on May 1st, which is the, you know, the big party of the year, and it's a really fun uh, opportunity to celebrate on the science of the Montchart. But we're here tonight about the Community Solar Forum, and I want to thank Alan Johnson with the Hartford Energy Commission, which is a uh, commission of the Hartford Select Board, for taking the lead in organizing this event. I'm going to throw it right over to Alan. Thank you. Um, first, I just want to introduce uh, the um, folks that came out tonight to make this happen, uh, that are sponsors for the evening. Uh, so there's some other people here from Hartford Town, Hartford Energy Commission, we just wave and say hi as I call out your various groups, just make sure <coughs> quick stand up. And uh, the other folks that helped us make this happen is the Norwich Energy Committee. Linda is in there? I think we got a scoop. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Linda had to take off. Uh, Upper Valley Sierra Club. Yeah. Got Carl, yeah. Um, I'll say that we do reuse and recycle everything that from the snacks. So when you're done with your dishes, please put them in the bucket, don't throw them away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, and everybody, please sign up. If you haven't signed up, we'll pass the sheet around. The, the sign up is very important for our attendance for the last half. Great, thanks, Carl. Uh, we've also got Sustainable Woodstock help make this happen. Sally's over here. And Sustainable Energy Resource Group, of course. We have Bob's in the back. And, uh, and of course, the Montchair Museum, and you've heard from them. We've got uh, a number of wonderful vendors in the room tonight. We have uh, Soliflect, which includes Jonathan Teller Ellsberg and Bill Bender. Wait. Where's Jonathan? Here. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> Sovereign Solar, uh, Daniel Hubbis. Hello. Norwich Technologies, which is Joel Stettenheim. See that? That's Joe. Joe back here. Yes, and Oliver Simpson. <coughs> Green Mountain Community Solar, which is Steve and Bruce Genero, and Larry Simonis. See that right? I got that one in the back. Catamount Solar is represented by Doc Bailey. Bakley, sorry. And Sun Commons represented by Taylor Ralph and Mike McGarvey. Um, so just before we get into our main presentation, I wanted to just say, well, one thing, I guess, to just roughly define what community solar is, in case anyone hears under the guise of something else. Um, so this is where a uh, group of people get together to share a solar installation at one location, and the output of that solar installation is spread across multiple <coughs> meters, we'll say, um, at disparate locations within the same utilities footprint. And so Green Mountain Power, anywhere in Green Mountain Power, you can buy into a community solar system, uh, as long as you're also on Green Mountain Power for your service. Um, I think most, if not all, of our vendors also work with on-site uh, installations. So if there's anyone here for that, you're welcome to speak to the vendors. But if we could keep the, the group conversation, specific to community solar, that'd be uh, preferable. And just for. Um, uh, if I could do a quick poll of the room, who here has a site that they would be interested in hosting a community solar system at? Show of hands. Okay, so we've got four folks with some, hopefully five, and uh, with some land that they might be willing to share and work with. So vendors, mark your targets. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, who here is interested in potentially participating in? Uh, as far as purchasing power from a community solar system. <coughs> All right, great. So roughly, why not? <laughs> Which makes sense. And finally, I'd also like to check and see um, who's from Vermont. Okay, and New Hampshire. All right, so that's that's good. I don't want to dismiss New Hampshire. Uh, I just want to make sure that we point out that this is mostly focused on Vermont solar uh, offering. 
That doesn't mean this is irrelevant to you. Um, I just learned that New Hampshire has passed some similar laws, and we do have some people in the room that can speak to the New Hampshire side of things. So definitely feel free to ask for clarifications uh, during the Q&A session. And the rough way, the, speaking of the Q&A session, the rough way the night will play out is I'll eventually shut up and introduce our main speaker. He'll do a presentation for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have the, uh, each of our vendors go through and have up to seven minutes, and I'll have a timer beep at you if you ramble on, and then you can just speak over the timer. Um, and then we'll throw things. And then we'll go into a Q&A session, a group Q&A session, and as that fizzles out, we'll start just having uh, mingling to have individual conversations off to the side and that kind of thing. So think about what questions you might want to have for the group versus what you might want to save that's really only relevant to you. And uh, as far as during the presentations, I would ask you to hold questions unless there's just a clarification. If you can't quite read something on a slide or you can't quite hear somebody say something, that's fine. Raise your hand. We don't want to leave anyone behind. But um, if it's a more general, longer-winded answer that you're looking for, then we'll save that for the keynote session. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Question. Will the yeah. material that you present uh, be available online anywhere so you don't have to scribble frantically? Well, we are uh, live streaming and recording this session. And Bob is usually doing that for us. Well, I actually, that Bob is doing it for us. I want to thank Bob Farnham. Oh, my, my Bob miss for not mentioning Bob Farnham for being here to <coughs> take this live. It's being aired uh, screened, or, uh, streamed live. And we will also be posting it. Uh, so we'll be sending out an announcement with a link to where you can see it um, uh, after the fact, too. Right. And so if you don't get that from Bob, However you heard of this, come back. If you got an email from me or from somebody else, just ask them. To <coughs> uh, or we have the sign-up sheet, too. Do we normally just send out to the sign-up sheet? Is that a Sierra Club sign-up sheet? Is that right? We'll show and send an email OK, so if you signed up on the sign-up sheet, put your email address it down. They'll, they'll make sure you get a link for all the materials and, and recording. And yes, thanks so much, Bob. I'm sorry I forgot there, to. There are 12 people who aren't here who are actually here virtually. So, okay. so far, there's 12 people watching. Welcome, our virtual <laughs> All right, moving right along. Um, so our speaker tonight is Kevin B. Jones. Uh, he is a professor of energy technology and policy and the deputy director at the Institute for Energy and Environment at the Vermont Law School. At the IEE, Kevin leads the Smart Grid Project and the Energy Clinic, at the, or, and the Energy Clinic, and is a co-author of the book *A Smarter, Greener Grid: Forging Environmental Progress Through Smart Energy Policies and Technologies*, <coughs> published by Prager. At the Energy Clinic, uh, at BLS, my screen just went dark. Technology, I should have used paper. The Energy Clinic at VLS is currently focused on promoting workable models for community solar. Prior to joining the faculty at Vermont Law School, Kevin worked as director uh, of power marketing policy for the Long Island Power Authority, was an associate director in Navigant Consulting's energy practice, and served as the director of energy policy for the city of New York under the administration of Rudy, Rudy, Mayor Rudy Giuliani. He received a PhD from Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute's Lolly School of Management and Technology. So I think you would be hard pressed to find a better person to speak to, particularly Vermont Community Solar. And with that, I will hand the mic over. There he is. Mic over to Kevin. Thank you so much. time here, what I want to do is um, talk a little bit about why I think you should consider going solar now, and talk a little bit about net metering uh, and how it works, discuss the solar incentives that are available today, talk a little bit about my view of what community solar is, um, and discuss a few different um, models of community solar, and talk to you about some of the resources that, that are available to help out if you're interested. Um, first, one of the main reasons to go solar today is the cost of solar has declined dramatically. Um, I, I put panels on my home um, in Chittenden, Vermont in 2010, and I can't believe um, how much I would have saved if I had just waited a, a short um, 
um, year or two um, after that. But it's it's uh, uh, a great time. Prices have really come down. Solar is incredibly cost effective today. In addition to that, um, and, and I'm going to talk generally about this is all going to be month based, but I can I can fill in a little bit about what I know about New Hampshire. Um, too. We're just learning at our clinic, and we um, very much want to learn more about um, New Hampshire's rules and, and, and help um, communities in New Hampshire go to Board also. Um, so um, here in Vermont, and uh, um, actually similarly in, in New Hampshire, one of the, the big incentives is the 30% investment tax credit that's available. Um, the important thing about that is that it, while it's in place today, it expires for residences after 2016 and will um, be reduced to 10% for commercial customers after 2016. The end, end, of two, two end, of, end, end of 2016, so through 2016. And um, as we all know, the way things are going in Washington these days, to count on them actually doing anything um, to support um, solar and extend these things is um, probably not something to um, you know, wait around for. Um, in addition, in Vermont, um, we have a Vermont solar adder that, that with um, the general net metering credit, um, provides a bill credit of 19 cents per kilowatt hour. If you're um, less than 15 kW, you get an extra um, penny there. It's locked in for a 10 year period. And um, the way it's, it's set up with a, the adder, which um, for GMP starts off at 4.3 cents, um, plus the residential rate, um, it will grow as the residential rate grows a little bit, but, but starting um, out at um, um, 19 cents a kilowatt hour. And uh, after 10 years, um, it's not quite, it, um, clear what will be the rate um, in Vermont for existing um, facilities. Um, um, but the, the, the adder is, is guaranteed for a, for a 10 year period and can help um, um, pay down the, the cost of the solar during that period. Um, also, it's likely to be reduced for new installations after 20, 2016. The Vermont um, you know, um, legislature has put it in the hands of um, the Public Service Board to design a new, pub, um, a new net metering policy. They've just begun the discussions on that. One of the assumptions is that the incentives um, may not be quite as good as they are um, today for new installations after 2016. One of the other big um, benefits here um, today too is that bank and credit union financing is readily available. I mean, there's there's a lot of credit unions and financial institutions that are that are financing solar with affordable rates and up to 100% of the costs of, of the installation. So and we can self finance it. And most importantly, sometimes we forget about this. We talk about the numbers and the savings and everything else. But I mean, solar energy is plentiful. It's clean. It's great for the local economy. And even when these these incentives um, go away, um, we should continue to do it because it's the it's the right thing to do for the planet and for the local economy. So I want to just take a minute and talk a little bit about um, what group net metering is compared to the traditional net metering. Under the traditional net metering, when you put the solar panels on your um, on, on the roof of your home, maybe your, your barn, um, maybe a land next to your house, um, essentially the, the process historically worked you know, um, was that it spun your meter backwards and um, at certain times you'd be putting energy into the grid, other times you'd be, you'd be um, you know, taking energy from the grid, but essentially you would get the the, um, um, the kilowatt hour credit um, for um, um, the production that you had. When you put the solar adder in place, a lot of installations in Vermont put their own production meter on, so you get the solar adder. So it's actually now a, a full accounting of, of the, the output there, um, but um, um, it essentially had to be on site um, to serve um, your own account. With group net metering and in Vermont's transition, you know, I mean, New Hampshire has, um, you know, is is on its way, I think, um, toward a, a, a workable system, and and um, Vermont's transition to, to something that I think is extremely extremely workable these days, and with um, um, group net metering or what what some places call virtual net metering, you can now locate the, the solar system um, offsite. The, as Alan said, the the one restriction is it has to be in the same. Um, electric utility service territory as the customers that are gonna, gonna net meter off it. And um, generally they're set up with their own production meter and uh, they're paid um, then um, the, the net metering credit you know, um, at the, the, um, the existing residential rate plus, plus the, the adder. And they, they put the energy into the grid and the utility does all the billing um, for the individual um, shares of ownership there. The, the, the utility will turn the output into uh, uh, a dollar credit and allocate it to the individual customer accounts um, per um, the, the directions of the administrator for the, uh, the group net metering facility. 
And so um, generally how these are set up, you're, you're getting a, a, a dollar credit on a monthly basis for your share of the production off the off-site solar. And it's it's uh, a great thing. My understanding is that um, how New Hampshire has implemented so far is that they're essentially giving the dollar credit to the, to the person that ends up being the administrator and they have to allocate it to the group. That's, that's as I've been told. And one of the differences in New Hampshire too um, currently is there is not um, a solar adder like in Vermont, so the, the, the incentive is a little bit, a little bit less. But um, it's it's a it's a workable start, and, and uh, I'm sure it'll get better over time. What are the benefits of group net metering? Well, um, residential commercial customers in the same utility service territory can form a group and share their solar energy by allocating net metering credits to each customer's bill in a fixed ownership percentage, and you get a lot of a, a lot of good things there. Economy of scale results in lower upfront costs. So, I mean, by having a, you know, 150 KW project, for example, versus, you know, um, 15 or um, 10 KW projects, you can get some economy of scale savings out of there, some good prices. Um, customers that don't have good pull, um, um, have poor solar sites can optimize the siting of their solar array by going with a community solar facility that is at, in an optimal site. I, I put one of my house in the Green Mountains and um, I love it, but it's not an optimal site. Um, <laughs> customers can also take advantage of, of credits that simplify the um, um, <coughs> so it works pretty well. Um, yeah. What are some of the challenges? Well, there's always some complications when you try to implement something like this. Um, you can only have one group per customer electric account, so um, you, you want to kind of get it right, and you want to go, you want to purchase enough solar to meet your needs. Because if you have an individual electric account, you can't currently, um, um, you know, um, be a member of a of a second group. There's some billing complexities. If you also have a home solar array, I wanted to join a group, but um, Green Mountain Power now is if you have a home solar array, they're sweeping, as I understand, your excess generation off your home array into the group and then reallocating it. It's a billing issue. Hopefully, we'll get beyond that, but it's just a complexity that you need to deal with if you have a home solar array. And you want to think about that if you're thinking of joining a group for additional input. Um, obviously, there, there are issues that what happens if you move you know, out of your um, current utility service territory. You know, that's really not a problem in some ways because when you sell your, if you sell your house, you get to sell your house with your solar array. Now you can sell your house and you can sell your share in the, the solar, you know, separately. So maybe there's actually, maybe it makes it easier in some ways. Um, obviously, you know, kind of warranties and insurance that you're getting um, with the group is important. Um, for if you're a landowner and, and your array is being put on your property, you clearly want to know what happens to the array at the end of the useful life. You don't want to, to have a contract terminate and, and be responsible for I'm removing that, although I think generally the scrap value people are estimating might might be enough to, to pay for the, um, the cost of uh, getting rid of it. And you know, anyone that goes solar, one of the things they know is Vermont with a lot of cloudy days, they're actually more depressing now when it's cloudy because not only is the sun not shining, you're not generating any solar, but that's no reason not to do it. Um, there's some other concerns, there's some other complexities here when we, we start going into community solar. It used to be, historically, um, we used to, we used to um, Essentially, um, well, let me let me take a step back. Um, there's a, a complexity when we um, when we try to account for who's buying renewable energy from our electric system. Um, electricity from all sources are physically identical, identical in the grid. You can't be distinguished at the point of use as coming from from one source or another. So you don't really know who's consuming energy once it goes into the grid. As a result of that, um, we created a renewable energy credit system where one renewable energy credit is created for each megawatt hour of renewable energy produced, and the credit can be tracked and, and accounted for. And RECs are the assisted, uh, accepted mechanism for tracking actual characteristics <coughs> of the energy sources that claim to provide renewable power. So today, um, there's the, the separate power that's, that's consumed um, from the facility, facility, the renewable energy credit, and only when those two are combined together are you actually buying renewable energy. And we'll talk about that a little bit more, that's an important issue. If you don't own the RECs, you're not producing renewable energy. Um, if a customer sells the RECs associated with energy generated from their solar PV installations, then those customers cannot legitimately claim to be using renewable power in their homes or businesses. Only the purchasers with the RECs can make that claim. Historically, when we did solar you know, years ago, and, and we didn't have production meters on there and everything, and we weren't doing these big things, and it wasn't such a such a, a booming business, most people left their, their RECs and their solar bundle. They never thought about these things. You have an array on your house, you're buying solar, you're getting solar energy. Um, today, with a lot of the group projects, there, there are certain developers that are actually separating the rule of energy credits from the net metering credits and selling them as separate commodities. 
The renewable energy credits are very valuable in states that have renewable portfolio standards, unlike Vermont, New Hampshire has one. The big market is Massachusetts um, and Connecticut also. They, they trade around five to six cents per kilowatt hour, so it's been a good business venture to separate them. The thing you need to um, know and understand is if you're buying from someone that separates the renewable energy credits, you aren't buying renewable energy. We'll, tell you what you're, we'll show you what you're buying. Um, if you're purchasing net metering credits without RECs, um, it actually increases your carbon footprint. It um, doesn't reduce it. Um, and this is actually not showing up correctly, but that first line up there, um, I'm missing a, um, a legend. That first bar, which is 43% you know, um, renewable and 57% fossil fuel, is essentially what we buy today for a GNP customer. Um, essentially, the, the mix of power sources that GMP has today has a lot of hydro, um, 43%, and a lot of nuclear and, and fossil fuels in it. Um, if we, on the bottom, if we were to um, buy um, from a community solar facility, 100% um, enough, enough net metering credits to cover 100% of our output, and we keep those racks bundled with them, then we can legitimately claim they were 100% renewable, 100% solar. But um, the, the magic and the math of greenhouse gas accounting is if you actually take uh, 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 energy contract, you strip the environmental attributes from it, what you are doing then is buying what's considered um, in New England the New England residual mix. The New England residual mix is pretty much 100% fossil fuel and nuclear energy. So this is one of the things, um, you know, people, if anyone's read my commentary about some of the states, um, Renewable energy laws, this is something we've done at a large scale with our, with our speed program and our standard offer program. And as a result, as we've invested more in, in these, so these, these renewable energy facilities, we've actually increased Vermont's carbon footprint. They're really exporting the, the, the greenhouse gas benefits. And in its place, we're getting credit for what's left on the system, which is the stuff no one else wants, which is the fossil fuel nuclear. So this is an incredibly important point. And you know, people really need to be aware um, in these deals that buyers need to be aware because there's lots of things. This is an actual project. Um, I won't say who the developer is on this, but yep. sign from Community Solar. It, it talks about you know, solar being on 50 homes, how it works, why Community Solar. But if you read the fine print there, it says you may not claim publicly that you're using renewable energy or solar energy in the contract. Why? Because the recs are stripped and you are not buying renewable energy. It's actually, um, there's a quote there from the Federal Trade Commission that talks about if you're a business and actually you you were buying from this and um, you claimed in advertising you were 100% solar when the RICs were, RICs were being stri stripped, you would be um, actually violating the Federal Trade Commission green guides and you could be subject to um, um, you know, um, federal action if, if someone um, filed a complaint about, about what you're doing. It's essentially false advertising, um, making false green claims, and it's um, not not legal. So be very careful about the contracts in three point print. A lot, you know, a lot. There's a lot of deals out there where the recs are are, are combined. You're truly buying solar. There's a lot of them where that's not the case. All right. So um, you want to go forward, and you're thinking about doing solar. There's a couple of big options. Um, you can you can. Um, Use lease models where there's usually not a lot of money down with um, monthly payments that you make, or there's usually no money down and you make monthly payments. Um, they may be more um, flexible, you can get in and out of them um, on an easier basis. Um, you generally have smaller long term savings because the, the third party entity that's financing is taking some of those, um, rightfully so, for financing the project. And um, usually the 30% federal tax credit flows to the entity that's, that owns um, the facility and, and they're passing on some of that value to you. And um, there may be an option to buy um, sometime during the period um, some of those agreements if you wanted to. Um, when you own, um, um, owning a share of the ray is also a very viable option. Like I said, there's great financing options for that today. You, you tend to get greater lifetime savings because you're, you're financing through your credit union or local bank, lower rates, and um, taking some of the risk yourself, but getting, getting a long-term payback. Um, um, there's various terms of ownership in, in the different um, vendors here can talk to you about that. And you, um, depending how it's set up, you likely can get the 30% um, federal tax credit um, as an individual or a, a commercial entity. Um, and once again, you know, don't read whether you're buying solar energy or not, whether the recs are going, no matter which model you're going through. Um, so that's kind of my overview of the process. I just want to tell you a little bit about um, um, what our energy clinic does because we can help communities out in this area. We, we um, do community, community solar outreach and education, like tonight. 
Um, we do initial cons consultation with um, community groups that want to do um, group net metering. And uh, we provide step-by-step -step advice on community solar development. Um, and we'd be glad to hear from you. You can reach us at Energy Clinic at Kamatlada.edu. Um, we have actually formed um, uh, a process to, to go through where you can actually um, have a, have a, um, form your own um, limited liability for having a community group um, actually um, own its, its own array and develop its own array. And we've developed some, some model agreements to do that. And uh, um, the best thing about us is our um, services are pro bono um, um, and free view. It's a learning education opportunity for our students. So. Thank you, and I'd be glad to take any questions when that's appropriate in the process. <laughs> so our, our first vendor is somewhat pseudo-randomly, because there was some uh, adjustments towards the end of the group, um, is Soloflect. So while I'm getting their presentation pulled up, um, if you have any questions uh, about the presentation you just saw, I think it would be fair to uh, take a minute or two to address some of those before we dive into the vendors. But remember, there will be more time for uh, questions to the whole group later. I have a question where you're setting up, and it relates to the pressures on the Vermont Utility Board. Uh, you say that uh, you alluded to the fact that the Vermont Utility Board may not be as generous uh, next time around. Uh, what are the reasons for that? They represent us, right? So what are the countervailing pressures that make them reduce incentives that we already have? And what are the politics involved? Well, in I, I, I only say, I think, I think part of the understanding, and, and once again, I mean, not to judge what they're, they're going to do, because they could come out and, and find that there's a reason to continue these kind of things. I think the, the, the safe assumption is that, that it's probably going to go, go down, not go up, just because of... Um, because um, the, the the solar adder is, is a little bit a little bit unique, and I think um, you know, I mean I guess I don't have, have a lot more um, to say because there's nothing nothing I think in the, the, the legislation that suggests it should go down other than than um, a lot of the speculation around it. So you don't know you don't have the inside information of the pressures coming from utility pressures coming from. Legislature well, pressures coming from us the, that will determine how the public utility board ultimately decides. Well, there's a process going on now, but there's clearly some utilities that want it to go down, and I've been told by you know, I mean, you know, I mean, almost like it's a fact by some of the state officials that 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 you know are important in this process, not outside the PSB process, that, that they're that it will go down, and, and I then say, well, how do you know that process has happened yet? But so um, I think it's it's, an, it's 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 an assumption, but not necessarily um, a, a foregone conclusion. I guess what I'm getting at is there a role for advocacy from groups saying no? We yeah. want you to do something else. Uh, absolutely. Green Mountain Power is owned by a Canadian uh, consortium. Why you know? And and <laughs> there's actually legislation going on right now with the reset bill, and and there's some unfortunate you know things that they're doing in there in terms of reducing. Um, in the legislation, it says the Public Service Board will reduce the credit to anyone that wants to hold on to their own renewable energy credits and create their own carbon footprint. And, and that has a lot of um, colleges and universities that, that are doing this to reduce their green, greenhouse gas emissions concerned in individuals. So there, there's, a, I mean, the le there, there's legislation now that could actually be influenced um, you know, that will be passed in the coming weeks. Right. That, I, I think, when you're ready to start. So. Yeah, I think, but I think we probably need to keep moving forward, and this is a, this is yeah. a great conversation, but maybe, maybe getting outside the scope of tonight a little bit. But um, I just wanted to ask, too, uh, you know, Kevin made a great presentation, an explanation of the renewable energy credits, the RECs, and if I could just get a, a quick show of hands of, of, of who would be, if anyone in the room would be paying attention to RECs, if that would be part of your decision-making factor in the, in the Okay, so a good portion of the room. So let me just let me just clarify uh, one thing that is on my mind. That, uh, as far as I know, and, and certainly anyone can feel free to correct me if it's if it's not if I'm missing something. But the point of the REC system is to uh, reduce the to incentivize solar and put the some of the burden of renewable energy on you know nuclear and fossil fuels, the non-renewables, right? So that the people paying for those RECs, people buying those RECs, are people that are mandated by a regulatory agency in New England to produce a certain amount of renewable energy. And this is a mechanism by which they can meet that requirement. So it's, you can, you, there's, there's a moral aspect to RECs, of course, but you can look at it 
from both ways and decide for yourself if you would prefer to put the onus on, you know, to help reduce your cost of going solar, so to speak, by having someone else pay their recs, or if you want to, you know, have that moral value to say, no, this is my solar, I, I am solar. Right? So that's the difference in recs. Now, Alan, I really have to disagree with you because you know you use the word that someone's going solar in in selling their recs. That that is well, that's what I mean. That is not that's legally you. I mean, that's legally you, not you can't say in any way that FTC has said it's it's very clearly um, keeping them bundled is the way to actually go solar. When you do that, you're actually buying brown, um, you know, um, power, um, the residual mix from New England, and you are absolutely not going solar, and it is. It, you know, for, for customers to say that they they're doing that, or for people marketing products to imply that their customers would be getting solar energy after they've done that is, is actually illegal. That's absolutely that's absolutely correct. I was, I was air quoting solar if, for lack of a better word, which absolutely right. You're not going solar at that point, but you are. Someone else is helping reduce the cost of buying panels that are on the grid, and so there's more solar in the world, and somebody's paying for it. And less of you is paying for it. If that makes sense, I, I would I would disagree with that too because essentially you're subsidizing. When, when you when you sell a rec, actually what you're doing is subsidizing someone to meet an existing requirement. Because when when you have additionality there, um, when you do something and someone else does something, you put additional solar in the system. Um, otherwise, all you're doing is is making a contribution um, toward meeting Massachusetts or 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 Connecticut's mandates, and they're and those are mandates. They have to meet them. All right, so you're not doing right. There's no additional solar as a result of that. Right. Okay. So with that all in mind, I would just ask that each of our would each of our vendors at least make a make a note of what they do with the Rex. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. That, since there's enough people in the chair. Go. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming tonight, and thank you, Kevin. Um, so, SolarFlect. My name is Bill Bender. I'm president of SolarFlect Energy. Uh, we're a solar technology company based here in the Upper Valley. What we do is make trackers, and you see a picture of them there. Um, and what's unique about our trackers as well is there's what we call suspension trackers. So there's actually a set of cables that hold everything up. There's cables in the front and cables in the back. Um, and we get rid of about almost three quarters of the steel compared to traditional designs. So we have we received two million dollar awards from the Department of Energy in some of the research and development we did for about five years in the Upper Valley, and we started selling in 2013, and now are one of the largest installers in the Upper Valley. The other interesting thing about trackers um, is that they're an upgradable technology. Concentrated PV um, is a technology that is is out there today, um, and in, it's currently getting resized to be able to fit trackers like our own. You need to point at the sun to use that. Those are twice as efficient even today. Um, so in the lifetime of these trackers, you're going to be able to upgrade these and probably be able to get twice as much energy from the same machine. Um, so what's the advantage of the tracker? Well, the advantage of the tracker is that it always points at the sun. So it moves east and west and moves up and down, and in the morning, um, it, uh, it points right where the sun is. If you have a fixed panel and you're in the summer, the sun rises in the, in the northeast and actually shines in the back of your panels for almost two hours, and the same at the end of the day. Um, there's actually only two times the, during the entire year where the sun is perpendicular to a fixed panel, and that's at solar noon on the two equinoxes, if you have it tilted just right, um, <coughs> where the tracker is always pointing at the sun, and you get about 40% more energy over the year from that. In addition, they're really good at snow. On these two pic pictures, a half mile apart and about four minutes apart. Um, in February, we had fabulous <coughs> production. Our February production this last February, really cold and snowy, snowed half the days of the month. Um, our production was almost exactly one twelfth of our annual production. So, um, we're talking about community solar. So, and Kevin sort of presented how. Now you can, if you live in the shade, which is most people, you can have a nice sunny field. We can have a bunch of trackers there. We have our, we did our first field last year. Um, and then that power gets split up the way with our model is you actually own the equipment. It's the best sort of long-term investment. Um, and it's allocated to you what comes off of your machine. Um, it is located somewhere else, so you have to pay insurance and taxes and land rent and things like that. So we take that as a share of the electricity. Um, so, I'm thankful for um, 
Kevin's introduction. I didn't know I was going to get quite as good an introduction to what we do, but we think some of his points are extremely important. Um, so this is a little bit expanding on his graph. This is your energy if you're a Green Mountain Power customer. So you're just over 50%. We need to compare numbers. They're slightly different, but um, you're about a quarter fossil fuels. You're about a quarter nuclear. You're about half um, renewable, which is mostly hydro Quebec. So that's what you are today. So you raise hands, say some of you were interested in community solar. Um, so presumably, you know, this is one of the better utilities in the country. It's not bad, really. So 50% renewable already. But you want to go s more renewable. So how many people here want to be more renewable than this? That's why you're here, right? Okay. Um, so, Jonathan, you want to get the... So... <coughs> So we have a solar solar module here. I'll explain a little bit and expand a little bit what Kevin did a nice introduction for us. So if we have solar, there's like two little wires that come out the back and makes electricity, right? And if you want to buy a solar panel, for example, this solar electricity could go to you and run your toaster, for example. Now with community solar, it doesn't have to be anywhere near your house. It can be you know 100 miles away as long as there's a green amount of power. And you still, there's electricity but electricity goes into the grid, and we have no way to label it. I mean, you know, my dream is, wouldn't it be great if we had a little electronic box and we plug this in, and it, all the coal electrons bounced off, and the nuclear electrons bounced off, and only solar electrons could come in. But we don't do that. Once you have an electron, it's, it's all the same. It's just a commodity. So we have to distinguish the commodity from the attributes. We know electricity coming from here is way, way cleaner than coming off a coal plant with all the the, all the carbon, the particulates, and the acid rain. So we separate that. So what we do is we take all those solar attributes and we try to stuff them in a little box and we can separate the electricity from these attributes that we know is a good thing. And we take that little box and we call it a REC. So a Renewable Energy Certificate. Okay, so that's what we have. Now, the electricity could still go and run your toaster, but you over here can say you ever want to buy solar and you get this, right? Now, so that's, now we know that that electricity can't go with you and you and you at the same time. It doesn't make sense. You can't run three toasters from the same panel. But what if I just make three boxes? Can I do that? What if I make a box for everyone in the room? Does that make sense that we have boxes for everyone in the room from this one panel? No, it doesn't make sense. There's only one set of renewable attributes you can have. If you take this, we put a little label on it. We put all the solar things in here. We send it to Massachusetts. Okay, we've sent that renewable attribute to Massachusetts. We put our postage on it. You do that, just like Kevin said, this is what your mix is. And this is legal. There's no confusion about this whatsoever. This is the legality. You get residual mix if you send those wrecks to Massachusetts. You're, um, whoops, the wrong one. That's a Green Mountain Power one. This is the one. You're 60% fossil and you're 37% nuclear. So that's what happens. If you send your RECs to Massachusetts or Connecticut, there's no legal confusion about this whatsoever. This is what you have. What we do, we're 100% solar. We're committed to that. We're a solar technology company. We believe in solar. We think if you want to go solar, you should be solar. Um, if you can save some money if you want to go full. But if you want to go solar, come talk to us. Thanks very much. Perfect. So um, in the last couple of years we've been building community solar sites. This was the first one in Putney and it's 150 <coughs> kilowatts. Um, it's all uh, dedicated to business owners, and there are three or four businesses that picked this up a couple years ago, and, and it was fully sold out almost within the couple of weeks that we had it available. Uh, since then, we've built uh, five systems. Oh, but here, I have a snow picture for you all. <laughs> <laughs> Who can read the time on that? I can't see that far. 11 morning. Right, so it happened to have snowed that morning, and I came out to, to see a neighbor, and figured I'd take this shot. 
And then just a couple of hours later, you can see that they've mostly cleared off. Now, these, um, the installations that Sovereign does, um, we don't use trackers because um, there's a couple of issues with them and I won't get into them because it's a great technology. We use seasonably, seasonably adjustable racks that tilt up in the wintertime to get a more extreme winter angle. You also get the benefit of the sun bouncing off the snow. But the main benefit of having your arrays tilted so far is that they shed snow like this. So you'll see a lot of installations that are, that are aimed for their summer angles and they, they do great in the summertime, but when you get a, a winter like we've had this year, uh, you get a lot of ice and snow, and it doesn't really clear off automatically. So that's my nice. snow picture. Uh, this is uh, Springfield, Vermont. It's uh, actually 170 kilowatt, I think, and it was um, sold out. It sold out pretty quickly. Uh, we had a, an open house, and a lot of people came up. I don't know if any of you have gotten in on any of our community solars. I think there's one lady here who was in on it. Um, this is our Townsend, Vermont installation, another community solar. And uh, what I like to see is all the different community solars, they take the shape of the land or they, or they make them, they force the land to, to be straight and flat, but they're all different. They're all like kind of sculptures out there. So it's really interesting. Um, this one is in Putney. It's a smaller 60 kilowatt system. Uh, is that the one you're in? You know? Okay, well, I won't call you again. <laughs> this, this, one, this one's in Brattleboro, and for the most part, a couple of businesses pick this up. There's a few people, uh, individuals that, that are um, involved in this. Uh, we're planning systems in Dumberston, looking at places in Vernon, uh, other places in uh, Westminster, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great situation to be in as a, as a growing company because we're providing a product that, that saves energy or that, uh, that creates green energy. Um, this thing about the RECs is very interesting, and uh, I, I actually wonder how many of the other community solar companies are also separating their RECs out and selling them. Because it is a revenue source, and as a revenue stream that's important to growing companies, I don't know if all these companies that are doing community solar are doing what we do, but we probably, you probably wouldn't see as, many, as much community solar action if we had to retire the RECs. So do that as it may, that's, that's only my opinion. Um, I don't know, we'll find out as, as everyone else uh, gets a chance to speak. So here's just a sample proposal from, from Sovereign, and um, uh, I can't read it because my eyes are, are bad, but mm -hmm. this is what you could expect. And so if you, if you grab my card, I can give you a free proposal, free quote. Uh, all I need to know is your, your yearly electric usage or your monthly average. And I'm happy to explain how it works and what the deposit is and whether you're eligible as a business or as a residential customer. Uh, there are some advantages to being a business because there are accelerated depreciation schedules that the federal government allows for businesses. So in the first five years, you can write off roughly 80% of your investment, uh, which is uh, kind of amazing. And um, there's... Um, Here's a payback graph. So for businesses, it's roughly seven years. For residents, it's roughly nine years for payback. And that includes a loan, if you have to take out a loan. Um, and here's an interesting thing. So we're, we're all predicting that electric rates will rise uh, over time. And so the, the red area is what you would pay for electricity over time. The green area is what you would pay for a loan. And you'll see how the green kind of drops off around 10 years or 15 years, whatever that is. <coughs> After that point, all your electricity is free. So, you know, whether you go with community solar or whether you go with solar on your home, it's the same principle. You're, you're pre-buying your electricity for the next 25 to 30 years. And, speaking of 25 or 30, Sovereign Solar offers a free maintenance contract with every purchase. So that means you don't have to pay a monthly fee for maintenance. Uh, we also bundle in uh, insurance for the whole field. So there's no additional insurance costs when you go with uh, our system. This is your typical kind of cash flow analysis where the red is your loan and the green is what the solar field or your solar panels are producing. Um, and you again would see that as a credit on your electric bill. Uh, some months are better than others. We had a rough winter this year. So you know some graphs won't be exactly the same if you actually look at the real world analysis, but this is typical. And that's it. Was that like three minutes or what? <laughs> <laughs> You're good. All right.
Any questions? Oh, yeah. You know which next? Hi there, I'm uh, Ollie Simpson from Norwich Technologies. Uh, <clears throat> we were started right here in Norwich and uh, our shop's in White River Junction now. So these are just some uh, images of residential installs we've done, uh, both rooftop and uh, stationary ground mount systems. So this is um, comparing a standard installation to a Norwich Technologies uh, installation. So in a typical solar installation, you go up on the roof, you put up the rails, you do the wiring, um, and then you, you carry the panels up one at a time, up a ladder, and you plug them in and get them in place. Uh, so it requires quite a bit of time on site, and um, you know there's, there's more room for error. Whereas uh, we do what's called easy PV. We build everything in our shop in White River Junction, and we wire all the panels together beforehand and we test them out before we uh, lift them with a crane up onto the roof. So uh, we only spend about a half day on site to do the prep work and then a half day on site to actually install the panels. Um, and it gives us a nice uh, high quality clean installation that's already tested before it even goes up on your roof. <coughs> <coughs> These are some systems uh, we've done. Uh, there's two pictures there of uh, the KUA system we did rec recently. Um, it was about 50 kilowatts. And uh, there's another Norwich install that we did in the winter. And uh, this is the Thetford <laughs> Elementary School project. Uh, that was a fairly large ground mount system um, on the land right near uh, the school. And uh, we're going to be building a similar array of this size um, in Norwich for a community solar array. Um, I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, so yeah, this is um, Solarize Norwich, you've probably heard about that. Um, we, we did it the last two years. It was a collaboration with the Norwich Energy Committee, uh, Solaflect Energy, and us. And through our combined efforts, there were 53 installs in Norwich um, in, in just in 2014. And this year, in 2015, uh, we'll be doing another solarized effort. Um, it'll be kicking off uh, fairly soon, um, early summer, I believe. And uh, we're going to introduce a, the Norwich Solar Farm to that. So there's going to be a community solar option. Um, so look out for that. Uh, there's some brochures on the table back there that you can check out, um, and we'll have a sign-up sheet also. Um, we're accepting cash purchases now. We're signing people up for that, so you can buy the panels in the array, and you get the, the generation from that. And we're working on a, a lease option as well. Um, so this is uh, the example of our, our pricing sheet for what our solarized pricing is going to be. Um, so it's a tiered pricing, so the more people that sign up in the town of Norwich, the lower the cost is for everyone. And uh, so you'll see the price per watt, that's the baseline for like a rooftop install, is $364 per watt. And um, that would be the same price for the community solar array. So whether the panels are on the roof of your house or they're in the community array, you pay the same baseline price. Um, there are going to be a few adders, like if you got a ground mount at your house, um, but that, that pricing will come out uh, when the Solarize Norwich kicks off. So yeah, um, there's my contact information. I'm uh, Ollie Simpson. I'm always available by phone. Um, happy to come out and do a site visit for you. Um, you can go to our website and uh, you can also stop by our shop at 52 Bridge Street in White River Junction if you want to um, see how we how we do things. We might be building some arrays. And uh, yeah, in the brochure 
Um, I wanted to point out on the inside, there's a couple of cool links. Um, so there's some great information at those links for like the Vermont uh, incentives. And uh, there's also a great link that you can uh, design a solar system and see how much it could potentially generate on your site. So yeah, that's it for me. Next we have Green Mountain Community Solar and they uh, opted out of slides for their presentation. So uh, if you could please try your best to ignore the technical fumbling that's about to happen off the side here and pay, give all your attention to him while we do our best to distract you. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Can you all hear me without the mic? Can you all hear me without the microphone? Yes. Okay. So my name is Bruce Genero, and I and I live right here in Norwich. And together with my uh, my brother and his wife, we run Green Mountain Community Solar. And our tagline is your panels and savings on our land. And our model is to make available uh, solar for people who can't do it at their house, for businesses or nonprofits who can't put panels at their house. You can put them up on one of our solar farms. This past fall, we put in our first farm in Groton, up on Route 302, and that has about 15 residences, one bank, and one nonprofit up in St. Johnsbury, and they all got together and participated in this project. And we have plans for two more projects this summer, one in Chester, which is south of here near Springfield. The other one uh, will be up in Groton, will be our second one there, and that will be for later in the summer. So we are actively uh, pursuing uh, selling panels in those projects. And we'd like to give you a chance to understand how you could figure out how you participate. So I've got a little bit of a display here. And so what we ask people to think about when they talk to us is what their GMP bill is, and let's do an example here. Let's say your GMP bill is $600 a year, or think about it in terms of monthly, that's about $50 a month. And if your target is to try over the year to get that bill to go to zero, then this example works. And one of our farms, based on the productivity of our panels, you're gonna need nine panels. We charge $1,000 a panel, assuming you could take the federal tax credit, you're gonna be out $6,300 after you take that credit. So that will save you $600 a year for 30 years. That's the length of the relationship we'll have. We cover all the maintenance, all the insurance, all the upkeep on those panels. You pay once and we have a contract that sets us in agreement for 30 years. And that will save you approximately $18,000. So at $600 a year, against a little over $6,000 out. That's about a 10-year payback on your money. And for those of you who are, are into these things, that's about a 12% return on your money. I don't know what you guys are getting on your cash, but I'm not doing 12% right now. So any of these projects, whether it's with these guys or with us, it's a good investment, and it's the right thing to do for our environment. We have two options when it comes to the renewable energy credits. We believe that those are an incentive that lowers the cost. We couldn't have our cost be the way it is if we didn't have those renewable energy credits. We calculate that to be a 20% difference. We are happy to allow you as a customer of one of our farms to have your specific credits retired. However, we have to charge you 20% more. That's just the way the whole economics of it work or we wouldn't be in business and we wouldn't have built our farm last fall in Groton if it weren't for those incentives. That's how it works in our mind. So, be happy to uh, talk to you. It's my brother Steve right here, and Larry Simonis in the back. All three of us are happy to talk about the particulars of a relationship. We have one, two, three, four customers in the first farm right here. I've got some GMP bills right over on my table that actually show the credits and our bills going right down towards zero, just like we predicted. And in February of this year, 
our panels were cleaned by local laborers who we paid, <laughs> and we did the math. We did, we, they cost us about $800 to keep them clean, and because of that, our panels produced $4,000 worth of credits for our customers. <laughs> so we're not afraid to clean the panels to make the economics work for everyone. Um, so our website is GM Community Solar. We're here to talk, and thank you for your time, and hope we can do some business. Next up is Catamount Solar. Yes. Does this work? Can everybody hear? Um, I want to thank all the sponsors for allowing us to be here. We're kind of a last minute entry and we appreciate it. Um, it's great to share the table once again with these guys. Um, we have a lot of great options here for various ways of going solar and uh, what a great venue to be able to come to and find out more about it. Um, Catamount Solar, we've uh, been in business for about four years now. We are a member-owned workers co-op. Um, we decided to go that route mainly oh, after the economic downturn, downturn of 2008. Um, we just saw it as a more democratic way of governing a, a, an organization where um, all employees, after a period of time, have the option to become members and owners in the company. And we see that too as um, a benefit in the community-minded um, venues of solar as well. And uh, we, we try to stress pretty heavily that, that um, anybody working with us and for us um, keep the community in mind. And with that in mind, we are not uh, offering a, a site or a specific system, we are more um, engaged in the Vermont Law School energy clinic model where we will work with communities and work um, in helping with siting and design permitting anything that goes along with um, the process. Um, we, the founding members of Catamount came out of um, various other renewable energy companies we all have about 14 years experience um, in solar and also wind energy. And um, you know, I feel very thankful that I'm working with some folks that I've worked with for a number of years and being able to continue the mission. Um, you can stop by our booth over here. We've done a number of installs in the area, both for farms and residents, um, businesses. And uh, we look forward to, to working uh, with with different groups and uh, and would be glad to get together with you at any point to discuss um, your thoughts and uh, hopefully put our expertise to, to use. Thank you. And last but not least, Sun coming. So I'm going to stand up here. Um, because we had some technical difficulties. So, pull it back a little bit. Um, we're all sitting there. Oh, that's what that was for. <laughs> there you go, you're good. Um, you're good. And I'll just project loudly because I have this in one hand. Um, so my name is Taylor, and this is Mike. Um, we are both from a community <coughs> organizing background um, unfortunately, Jessica Edgerly, who was scheduled to be here, broke her hip, um, which was last minute, of course. Um, so we're really excited to be here and help you understand our community solar array program. Um, Mike is, a, is also a customer of one of our CSAs, but he also has a big hand in running the CSA program, so he's a really good resource. Um, so just to introduce Sun Common, we're a mission-driven benefit corporation based up in Waterbury Center, and the bread and butter of our work for the past couple of years since we've been in existence um, has been residential arrays. So that's certainly something that we still have and are excited about. The idea is that there's no upfront cost and then um, a fixed monthly payment that can hear and replace your utility bill. Um, in doing this work, for a couple of years, we, like everyone else here, 
has recognized that there are plenty of people that are interested in um, benefiting from renewable energy, but can't because they have a roof that potentially looks like this, um, or is facing the wrong direction, or has a slate roof, or for one reason or another, it doesn't make sense. What's that green thing trying to eat that house? That's a tree. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, problem solved. I won't go into too much of the detail about what community solar arrays are because we've just had such a great rundown um, from anybody or from everybody, but the idea is that a bunch of folks can benefit from solar credits produced by a larger array that are located, that's located in a sunny spot um, because of group net metering, which Vermont is a proud supporter of. This is one of my favorite just like mini examples of how group net metering can be beneficial to folks. Um, this is an example on Lincoln. Jim had a church that was, uh, the community was really interested in, in going solar, but they couldn't benefit in the same way from the incentives as a nonprofit. Um, and Jim could. So Jim put a bunch of extra panels up on his barn, and because of group net metering, that church was able to benefit from that solar power. Um, and a community solar array is the other way that this happens. Um, the way that our community solar program works is that each person has a membership. Um, so it's not ownership, it's not lease, it's a percentage membership of that particular array's total output. So last year we did eight of these, they're going really well, um, and we're planned to do dozens more this year. Um, this is a little fun graphic, but gets the idea. Um, again, this has already been covered, so I'll just skip over it. Um, but really, this all starts with the host. So Sun Commons working with landowners to host these arrays. And of course, there's compensation for those homeowners or for those landowners. But the biggest exciting part of it is being able to provide this benefit for their friends and neighbors that couldn't otherwise participate in building renewable energy in state. Um, so we work with two different size arrays. Some of our owners own hundreds of acres of land, other of them, others own just about 10 acres, but we can work with folks that only even have two to, two to five acres. So we do 150 kilowatt arrays as well as 500s. Um, so if that sounds interesting to you, please let us know. Mike specifically would love to chat with you if you're interested in hosting one of these CSAs. Um, apart from working out the land agreement with us, our CSA, we call these CSAs, I didn't say that, but um, community solar arrays, they're, the hosts are not responsible for any of the um, solar development process. We own, build, um, maintain, operate the array, and so all of the onus is on us. Insurance? And yes, everything. Yep. Um, and we also work with the members to get them signed up so that the landowner and the host doesn't have any responsibility to fill the array or anything like that. <coughs> the Another benefit to hosting is that you get first dibs on membership. So if you um, have a bunch of friends and family that are interested in participating, you can kind of carve out as much of that as you want. We're building these all over the state. I think the closest one that's upcoming is in Bradford. So the local residents of that community will have two weeks to fill up the array. If they can't fill up the array, then we'll let members from all over the Green Mountain Power Service area fill in. Um, so this is an example of one of our arrays in, in Addison County. Um, the other big piece of the puzzle is the solar community members. So, two minutes, okay. So we created our CSA program with two things in mind, um, or two goals in mind, is one, to create an opportunity for folks that don't have the right um, orientation to participate, um, and the other for those that couldn't otherwise take advantage of the solar incentive program. So how does membership work? Basically, there's no upfront cost. In order for it to be a legal contract, there needs to be a deposit, so you owe $1 from the get-go. Um, and the idea of the membership is that your monthly payment will be at a 7% discount to the total value um, of the <coughs> renewable energy credits, or the, the net metering credits um, being produced. So if you are producing $100 of value with your membership, it only costs you $93. So the idea is to save you from the get-go. Um, I'm at only two minutes, so let's see. One minute. One minute, okay. 
So we can talk more about memberships. It basically is there's no upfront cost. You have a fixed monthly payment that's a guaranteed 7% savings, and we true up at the end of every year to make sure that you're getting that. Um, again, all the ongoing maintenance is on us. And then regarding recs, we totally agree with the philosophy that you described, um, but also believe that these recs are kind of crucial for deploying renewable energy in our state, and if they didn't exist, we would not have as much renewable in our state. So for the first seven years, our recs are sold to make the progress um, financially viable, but then after the seven years, they're retired. Mm. So I'll just leave it at that. So uh, before we jump into our Q&A session, just a couple of um, housekeeping things. We have a, uh, a hard stop at 8.30. Now that doesn't mean we have to stop talking at 8.30. It means we have to be out of the parking lot at 8.30 because they're going to close the gate. <laughs> so we were going to have a soft stop at 8.10 for Q&A, and then you're free to mingle at your own risk. And on your way out the door, if you would please um, take a chair and stack it. You'll see the carts rolling around with stacks of chairs in your way out. It would really help us uh, clean up <coughs> afterwards so that we can get out of here before they lock us in, too. Uh, given that Montshire is sponsoring, I don't think they're going to lock us in. But they might lock you in, so let's not dally past uh, 8.30 getting out of the parking lot. Um, now, for the Q&A session, I'll, uh, again, let's try and keep the questions to Community Solar and think hard about if your question is uh, more relevant to the group or if it's something really you should have off, offline or, or you know, after the meeting or in the uh, mingling session with an individual vendor. Um, if it's a question for all the vendors that you'd like to hear from, sure, that's, that's fine too. And rather than pass the mic around the room, um, what I'll do is, is I'll repeat the question into this mic so that we can all hear it and we'll leave this mic to be handed up and down our row of panelists. And as I hand this mic off to the middle of our panelists, um, is there, I, did, I failed to ask a show of hands of folks who are already, already uh, buying into a community solar system themselves. All right, so those folks are in the room as well. Um, I'd ask that you not direct questions to them now, but certainly feel free to, one more time with your hands up so people can find you if they want, if you're willing to speak, if you're not, put your hands down and hide. Okay, so questions, please. Yes, sir, in the green. Is that me? Yeah. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I have a qu I have, I've been approached, I have a small solar company, and uh, I've been approached by a number of customers who uh, want to know where all this great financing is coming from. Because the only financing they've found, they don't think is really so great. Um, in other words, people get told that, um, well, if I finance this, let's say a system costs $15,000, I can finance it and only pay what my electric bill is. Let's say your electric bill is $85 a month. So <clears throat> getting the payments down to $85 a month and all the credit unions and banks I've talked to, none of them have rates that low. So I'd like to know where the money is that's so um, you know, available and easy to find and low interest and all that. Does anyone need me to repeat that? I think he was heard well. Bob, you're good. <coughs> Uh, so I would answer that in two quick ways. The first way that Sun Common deals with that problem, um, I'm Mike McCarthy from Sun Common, um, is that we have partnered with different financial institutions. Some, uh, many Vermont credit unions we're working right now with rolling out a program with the SECU, for instance, where we've got an exclusive financing through us that we can offer. Um, that is really great financing for our community solar model. However, to keep it to that, is that we, unlike really anybody else in the country, you have a model where you don't have to finance anything yourself individually. You just agree to make a monthly payment. It's going to be lower than your electricity bill. You, we guarantee you a 7% savings. And the financing for our project that Sun Common actually leverages um, has been from a variety of different investors. Uh, one of them was an in-state investor who sold a large asset and could leverage the tax equity, which is a big problem for a lot of folks who want to do community solar is that they can't use that 30% tax credit. So we solved that problem. Um, this year, a number of our projects are going to be funded by uh, a renewable energy venture capital firm out of Massachusetts um, and a few individual investors. So that's where our money's coming from. <coughs> uh, well, Sovereign Solar has partnered with uh, Green Mountain Credit Union. 
but you know, all loans are generally secured with some kind of asset. So if you have a home and you already have an existing relationship with your bank, then probably your best bet is, is a home equity loan or a line of credit with the bank. I've seen those in the 2 to 3% range. Um, Green Mountain Credit Union is a bit more than that uh, because they're using your panels as a way to secure your loan, which is actually a very unique way to do it. Uh, the other uh, organization that I send people to is the Vermont State Employees Credit Union, VSECU, I believe. They have several good programs. I can't quote the rates off the top of my head, but they vary from 2.9 to 4.9, something like that. So there are a lot of resources. I'm happy to talk with you privately about them, but again, you know, they're secured one way or the other, and the banks do have to make some money on this. So you're, if you can afford to invest directly without a loan, that's really the best way to do it. Pace? Is Pace yeah. eligible? Uh, Sorry? Yes. Well, there are Pace, yeah. Then there's so. also on-bill financing. So there's a number of new mechanisms. Uh, Green Mountain Power is offering an on-bill financing option for its clients, and I think that will work with Community Solar as well. Check with your town to make sure that the Pace program has been approved. Uh, I believe it has here in Norwich. So. Yeah. yeah. Pace rates are ra rather high, so you're looking at over six percent as far as our income. Yeah. Just on just right. Not for, not for solar. Not for solar or electric. Ah, okay. Right. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, I'd like to make one point is for those of you who are thinking about financing, if you think about what we proposed here on almost every one of these projects, uh, the economics are better than a 10% return on your money. That's if you put your money up. If you go borrow from the bank, let's just say at 5%, and you're getting a 10% return on your money, that's called leverage. So it actually makes sense if you can get your head around it, to borrow against your house, borrow against the panels, and both of these programs at VSECU and Green Mountain Credit Union are custom for community solar. And the people who work there know exactly what you're talking about, and they will know the players, some of the players at this table, and they'll be able to respond very quickly to any interest you have in finance. Right. So I'll just quickly add that uh, a detailed list of a lot of the financing options that are available for solar and other energy efficiency uh, energy projects. You go to efficiencyvermont.com, click on my home for my home, I think it is, and then there's a financing link there you can click on, and they've got a table with a, a long list of, of options, including PACE, and you can follow and see which towns have approved PACE that's, that's tracked on their site as well. Um, well. If you need help getting PACE passed in your town, let me know I helped it harder. It's ma'am in the blue. Is that me? Yes, that's you. Yes. Uh, oh, sorry. If I could just ask to, and for the vendors as well, I, I really appreciate it when this gentleman stood up and projected. If we could all do that and the vendors as well so we can see it. How close do I have to live, I live in Norwich, to one of these solar um, communities? Do I have to look around and see if there's one near me, or do I just call somebody up and say, <coughs> Just in the same utility, so Green Mountain Power. So it can be anywhere, which is probably 80% of the state. I so you do, it, does, it can be anywhere within well, the same utility. And mine are on the other it side of the state. Anywhere. I live in St. Albans, and my panels are in Waltham. <laughs> <laughs> Waltham, Vermont. Vermont. OK. We <laughs> 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 sold the panels and the rigs. <laughs> That's close to Virgins, in case you guys uh, don't know the Champlain Valley. <laughs> other questions? Yes, sir, in the gray here. Um, it was mentioned early in the presentation that one of the advantages of community solar is taking advantage of economies of scale. I'm wondering if you take the average Vermont home that uses maybe five kilowatts or something or might need that size array, what's the sort of minimum um, contributors to a community system to make it viable for those individuals? My answer to that question uh, is that doing a 150 kilowatt system maximizes the ease of permitting, sorry. Uh, so a 150 kilowatt system maximizes the ease of permitting with that economy of scale. So for us doing community solar, 150 kilowatts is where it's at. Um, it doesn't get you into the more complex permitting, but it allows you to, to sign up 25 or 30 members with the average Green Mountain power usage. Um, if everybody uses as little as I did, we could sign up 50 people to a 150 kilowatt system. Um, if anybody else wants to answer that differently. I'll just point out too, you know, if you can, if you can do it on site on your roof, if you've got a good roof for it, 
when I when I did my shopping, that tended to be the more economical way to do it. Um, it does exclude some options um, like the leasing system. Well, no, I think some vendors will also will also provide leasing for on site as well. So, uh, Bob, I've got somebody there. in Montpelier who's asked um, in New Haven, Vermont. There's a backlash of solar installations. Uh, has that backlash been seen in any parts of the Upper Valley or anywhere else uh, the panelists know about? So is there is there solar pushback happening in Vermont? That's the question. Just, just raise your hands if you're having trouble hearing. I'm getting a sense that we're projecting well enough for the room. So. Uh, <coughs> there, there is uh, sensitivity on the part of all of these companies and, and all of the installers uh, to, to make sure that they're not using prime agricultural land or they're not cutting down forests to put in panels. Um, I, I think that th there's probably much more of a backlash with big wind installations. I know we're selling out as, just about as fast as we can put these systems up. Uh, there is, you know, there is a process where abutting landowners can object, and we try to be very sensitive to that and, and pick really good sites. Um, it's important to make sure everyone's happy. That's oh, the next one. Yeah. First issue. Um, one of the things that our company, Green Mountain Community Soil, looks at is when we look at sites, we want to do our best to see that we're using land that could not otherwise be productive and put that to productive use. And we also do our best to make it so that um, the sites are minimally visible from, um, you know, so that they don't become a new part of our landscape that we can enjoy the existing Vermont landscape that we are so used to. <laughs> Solzlex is actually calling our uh, community solar facilities uh, Solzlex community solar parks. So uh, our first installations have been on fairly large parcels, so we're not just finding a small piece of land and putting solar on it. Um, so there's actually some recreational opportunities for our customers where, where we locate them. Yes. Thank you, my name is Colin High. I work for RSG, a consulting firm which specializes in uh, energy issues. However, I'm not going to ask a question about that, but I'm wearing another hat. That other hat is that I'm um, uh, working with uh, my church, the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Upper Valley, right here in Norwich, and we want to install solar. Um, I would like opinions from any of you. Um, as a non-profit, we are able to take advantage of the tax benefits, but I'm sure that you smart people up front there know how to get around that problem, and I, I'd appreciate hearing. <laughs> uh, yeah, he's a gentleman in the back, but let's hear from the vendors first. <laughs> he is one. I mean, he's one of them. Okay. I'd love Come to on, take a step. I can answer your question. We just were approached by a church in Chester, Vermont, where our farm is going to go in this uh, this May. And the relationship that we're working with that specific church is to give them a 15% discount off of our price. And what we're trying to do is give a little bit from our pocket to them because they are not eligible for the 30% federal investment tax credit. And that's how we've handled that as a company. We take a portion of one of our farms and we give that to a nonprofit at a discount. So the other model that Sun Commons using, uh, which would be an option if the church or a church member had the land, is that we would compensate the church or that church member and then give the whatever the uh, church needed to offset their power and offer exclusive memberships to folks who are associated with the church before we started selling memberships into our community solar array for um, non-affiliated folks who weren't affiliated with the host. So for all of our hosts, whether it's a church or it's a farm or it's just a private landowner, um, we kind of give them first dibs on the memberships and they don't have to worry about the tax equity and the tax credits and they don't have to worry about the financing. We'll come in, we'll compensate them and then we'll offer the memberships to those folks. So the innovation of the model that we have is that it doesn't require anybody to sort of put all the money we take care of that piece. So again, it, it depends on whether you want to go solar or go fossil. So if it's about a quarter million dollars on a 150 kilowatt project, the value is selling the RECs to Massachusetts. Um, so 
um, you can get from some very good deals if if you want to um, illegally say that your church is solar and at the same time someone in Massachusetts says they are solar from one set of panels. Mm -hmm. um, so um, if you really want to be truly solar, please stop to us. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, so, so to clarify, the question was I think about the tax incentives, particularly more than the renewable energy credits, yeah. but is there, a, is there an implication between the two here? The only thing is that if you have that quarter million dollars on the table, that it's, off, it's easier to offer all sorts of extra benefits or incentives. If you want to, it, but there are, if you want to talk to us, we'll, we can be creative around tax credits and we can help you with that. Can I, can I just say, I, I will talk to you, but for, for the rest of the audience, I, I, I am very, I, my professional life, um, uh, the, the whole issue of RECs and how you measure them and evaluate them is what I specialize in. I'm very concerned about the legitimacy of some, not all, but some of the rec transactions which underlie uh, some of what you're doing. Not, and, um, and I'd be happy to chat with anyone. So, okay, so one thing that uh, may or may not apply, maybe somebody on the panel can uh, clarify for me. The way the town of Hartford got around the tax incentive issue uh, is we have about uh, almost a megawatt of panels being installed on our uh, closed landfill. And uh, the way that we worked around that is, um, well, long story short, in the end, the Grow Solar decided to come in and install all the panels and take all the tax credits, lease the land from the town, and then sell the power to the town at a reduced rate. Um, that may require, to get, it, to get it, it, an investor interested in that, may require a, pan, a, a system of a certain size, but that is, that is a mechanism that the town of Hartford, being a nonprofit and does, doesn't take that tax credit, was able to That's indirectly take advantage of that. That's the energy in that case. Let's just be, let's be honest about what's going on. Well, yeah, yeah, as far as I know, I don't know. I, I imagine that Gross Solar sold the wrecks. I don't know if they did or not, really, but I would be a little surprised if they didn't. But again, two separate issues. Selling the RECs is different than getting the, ta the federal tax incentives. Sure, right? Bill, tell, tell them about the arrangement you have with the town of Norwich, which is another model similar, but without selling the RECs. So, yeah, so the town of Norwich now, which is, there'll be a press release in this probably within the next week or so, um, but the town of Norwich is now 100% solar. Um, that's been <coughs> true for a couple of months now, but we're just getting all the, the little things um, finalized. Um, and it's actually, we did an investigation in that because the, the racks are retired. So the way that is, um, that's part of our community solar. We take the hosting fee, like I said, 20% of our hosting fee. Um, and that is what's actually uh, going to Norwich. And that's the kind of thing we could do um, for a church. Um, but in this case, it, it turns out we did quite a bit of investigation. And because of our contacts with DOE, we asked them to search around some. We've actually only managed to find, and I'm sure there's some more somewhere, but we've only found three communities in the entire U.S. that are 100% solar legally where the RECs are actually retired and they have a legal claim to be solar. And Norwich is one of only three that we can find in the entire United States now. Um, so that's the model where we truly believe in solar. Um, it is cheaper to, to say you're solar here and to also take that same energy and say you're solar in Massachusetts. If you double count, there's more money on the table. Um, if you take that money off the table, yes, it's, it's a little bit more expensive. Um, but it's true, truly solar. So no, we're, we're actually quite proud of that. And Norwich is, is one of the very first communities in the entire country that is legally 100% solar. And so, and, but that is, is the model, and that's how we, we do work with nonprofits. What do you mean? I live in Norwich and I'm not solar. No, 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 this municipality. <laughs> so Tracy Hall, police and fire station, all the speed limit signs, uh, all the electricity that the town, not the individuals, but the, the town, the municipality itself. And it's kind of amazing that we can't find more than three. They're, they, I'm sure there's some somewhere, but they're not making it so, public. So were you able to take advantage of any of the federal tax credits as part of that deal? Or is this, is that, you get either or, the RECs or the credits, is that how that yes, works? The, yes, so, yes, we, totally we that is set up so that the tax credits mon are monetized now. But it, I would just okay. want to clarify that RECs and tax credits 
totally separate, totally separate financial. And a, and a community solar system can take advantage of the federal tax credits. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Okay. And and I presumably pass that savings along to their users. Okay. I'd like to say what's interesting here is that we have a wide range of different models for community solar. And it, there's probably at least six that, that I know about. In fact, I, I wrote a small article in the Green Energy Times. How many of you actually read Green Energy Times? Mm -hmm. Right, so all of you should be reading Green Energy Times. And there's a couple of copies over there. You should grab it and, and read about it because there's, there's a model I've missed <coughs> here that Mike pointed out uh, from Sun Common. Um, but uh, it, it's interesting that there aren't such a variation. There'll probably be more models of community solar that mix and match different kinds of arrangements. Uh, and just FYI, Putney is 80% solar at this point, the municipality, not the whole town. So we're working on it, but we didn't quite get to 100%. <laughs> and the gentleman in the red over here has been trying for a while. Back, back, if you would, to the nonprofit question. I uh, have only not have a nonprofit in New Hampshire, but do most of the work in Vermont and Norwich. So my question is, is there any advantage, can a small nonprofit have any advantage, or maybe Bruce could answer this, in, in the setting up of, of a, uh, a solar system on the owner's farm, and is it, does it get in trouble if the nonprofit's legally in New Hampshire and I want the solar system on my side? There, there, by the way, there are 8,000 nonprofits registered in Vermont and almost 7,000 registered in, uh, in New Hampshire, so you better be careful if the solar industry commits to nonprofits because there's a lot of us out there. No, I, I'd love to be able to keep everyone satisfied, but we have a we have a, a threshold percentage yeah. that we can offer that discount to. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer and I'm not a tax guy, so um, I'm happy to point you in the right direction with some of those questions, but uh, it would be inappropriate for me to expand on that right now. This gentleman, you left. Oh, did you go ahead. Work to on the tax stuff? Or? Well, I just think that it's totally the tax uh, credit is all about who owns the panels, not about who, whose land they're on or who gets the net metering credit. So you can absolutely have a third party own panels that are on a person's land and have a nonprofit take at least a portion of the net metering credits. Yes. Or the yeah, I, I've heard a lot of talk tonight about financing, about RECs, about uh, all these kind of arrangements and so forth, and I want to know about hardware. Um, I, I, I farm for a living, I buy a lot of machinery. Uh, if somebody came up to me and said, you know, we got this great tractor, and, uh, and I said, well, that's great, well, how, you know, when did, tell me about it. Well, we developed this thing in the last 10 years, and, uh, well, this model right here is all new, and it's, three years old, right? And, 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 and it's gonna last you a lifetime. Uh, I mean, you know, I'd say, pal, I have a couple words for you on this one. So <laughs> you people are trying to tell us, I mean, I wanna hear about this hardware. You know, you guys have this thing you've had for four years or whatever. I mean, how long are these things gonna last? I mean, several years ago, people were talking about, you know, ways of vapor barriers and houses, and this is the greatest high-tech stuff, right? Ten years later, the houses fall apart. So I, I, I think you got to. I mean, you, you're all talking about this new stuff. So how about some talk about the hardware? Okay. So solar panels actually have been around since the late '60s, at least, and and NASA has been using them in space. And they, the companies that manufacture them, do accelerated like aging processes on them to calculate their life. The panels themselves, uh, and I'm sure that all the, all the different installers use similar equipment here, so I'm <coughs> just going to speak for everyone. The panels themselves are warranted for 25 years. At the end of that point, they need to be producing roughly 80% of their nameplate value, or they'll get replaced. Now, there's there's some problems because and over time, across the board, across much, the board right? yeah, that's a standard warranty is 25 years on a panel. Some of these companies are offering an extended warranty and they're just betting that they either will have an extra panel to replace one if it, it goes bad <coughs> after 25 years. Um, sometimes the shape of the panel is a little different or the electrical characteristics are a little different and it might mean re-racking a portion of your array, but that's, that's <coughs> the responsibility of the company because in most cases, all of these companies are offering <coughs> their own warranties and their own maintenance. 
Sometimes the maintenance comes out to be a monthly service fee. Sometimes it's built in. Sometimes you're just paying for power. So there are differences there. Now inverters are, they're a little less reliable. They're the boxes that collect the electricity and convert it to the right kind of power to hit the, the grid. And those usually last 10 to 15 years, sometimes a little less. But again, they're, they're under warranty for at least 10 years, I believe. And that's, again, the responsibility of the, the company that's running the community solar. So here's an interesting thing. If you decide to put solar on your house, and you have the world's best roof or the world's best like backyard, and you, and you install solar, you get probably a 10-year warranty from the installer. And you're on the hook for the maintenance and the cleaning and you know, keeping an eye on your system. And then after 10 years, you know, you're, you're on the hook for the maintenance of so replacing the inverter if it goes, or keeping track of the solar output and replacing panels, or dealing with the company that, that installed them to replace the panels probably at your cost. So that's one of the benefits of community solar is that it re releases you from the, the maintenance and the involvement in day-to-day -day operation of the, of the uh, installation. There you go. Yeah, I just wanted to say that um, our systems are all stationary, so there's no moving parts, whether it be a roof-mounted or a ground-mounted system. So as we say, there's no moving parts, just moving electrons. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I also wanted to mention uh, our community solar array, we are going to retire the RECs. I forgot to mention that earlier. So. And let me just add to that quickly that, you know, of course, whenever you get into business with anybody, you need to pay attention to who's, you know, who, who, who you're doing business with. In the case of the panels, panel manufacturers, if you're buying and putting on your house, probably the most important thing is who, who the panel manufacturer are. If they're warranting it for 20 years, that's great. But if they go out of business in three, yeah, that's three a years, good that's true. True. And the same thing applies, of course, to business solar. Businesses go so, in and out of business. You know, that's right. Like, remember Rusty Jones? That yes. Was great. <laughs> yeah. And so we have we have uh, got to wrap up here just in a couple minutes. So we have time for maybe one more question. And uh, Bob, did you have some John, did you have something? I was just going to follow up on that one particular point that um, I'm with Norwich Technologies, I work with Holly. Um, <laughs> the <coughs> comment I was going to comment on, I go to church with you, sir, so we'll talk uh, in church yeah. about what we can do for the church. Uh, <laughs> but um, the, the, the top rated panel manufacturers also, um, they insure their warranty. So that's an important thing to recognize because people are worried about that. Well, great, you give me a warranty, you're a five-year-old company. How are you going to warranty something for 30 years? So those are usually insured warranties. Um, so talk to your installer and make sure um, the top-rated top panels are a little bit more expensive, but those are always worth getting this. All right, and so does that also apply with uh, community solar? Do, yeah. do you guys insure your warranties in case you go out of business? They are insured. The panels degrade gracefully over time, so it's something like 1% to 2% a year max. And, and right? Okay, so it sounds like this issue is pretty well covered, but obviously you don't want to do so. Yeah, the top rated panels, it's like a quarter of a percent per year. So you're talking about 90% of what the sticker says at 20 years. Right. And um, and I would say that's pretty much all of us are, I think, I don't know all of our companies, but I'm pretty sure all of us are using manufacturers that are, you know, like SunPower or LG that have. And, and the panel is no longer, I mean, it's still useful after that period. The life expectancy is 30, 35 years, 40, before you really want to consider replacing the panels themselves. And so, okay, so one last question, if it's quick. Can you, can you do a quick one? Are there any uh, trackers, moving parts, or something? I think that's for this end of the table. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we, we are a technology company. We're relatively small, so we're not a billion dollar company. We talk to our customers a lot about that. Um, a lot of the cost is in ground costs, so some, literally some costs like concrete, um, concrete that comes back to your house, steel that, you know, so all of those things in, in the modules. So the, the part of the entire component that moves is a relatively small percentage of the entire installation cost. Um, the thing, um, and we're happy to go through in a lot of detail, specifically what we, we've done, our engineering staff is all right here in the Upper Valley, so you can come and kick us in the shins, basically. Um, but the, the, the advantage of Tracker, so we do as a relatively small newer technology company, there, yes, we acknowledge there's some more risk, and some of our customers you know, are happy to, 
the, the thing that we're trying to do is really get the cost of solar down. And one of the things we're really excited about is the upgrade potential with the tracker. Um, because there's concentrated PV out there now, it's, it's been in, there's hundreds of megawatts that are around the world. It's just been all utility scale. And that's actually getting downsized right at the moment. We're working with companies in California to bring that into the market. Um, that's today is twice as efficient. So that tracker would double. It won't, it won't get all of that in Vermont because of um, the amount of clouds we have, but it'll still increase it. Over probably 10 years from now, it'll, it'll be triple the efficiency, and that will, in fact, double the amount of um, energy. So there is some more upside risk or outside risk in 20 years. When we talk about $20 financials, we do on a 20 year. Um, just be a little more conservative because it is a moving machine. Um, but in that time frame, like the 10 to 20 year time frame from now, we know that you're going to be able to take a, the vast majority of that cost, which is all sitting there, either underground or steel or whatever, do some upgrades on the electronics and the motors, but especially on the panels. And you're going to have twice as much electricity on that same, um, same site. So now when you put in your heat pump or you get your electric car or those kinds of things, um, you're going to have that, that kind of potential to upgrade. So we have some upside benefit, and you, know, you could say, yes, we're a little bit riskier. All right, so that's going to have to wrap it up for tonight, folks. Again, if you could please uh, grab a chair on your way out. And uh, if you want to, don't forget to uh, support me.